Hi, Kevin. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Good to meet you. We've got Kevin. Kevin Lester. I'm, I'm very well, yeah. So we've got Kevin Lester here from Validus uh, Risk Management with us today. Um, so great to have you here. Uh, I think we've had a bit of a, we've had a, I've had a two week break for, for half term. So we're back on the case now with the leaders series. Excited to do it. I feel refreshed. <laughs> um, so just to kind of reacquaint you guys with it, we're kind of watching. Um, GCS is a technology recruitment agency. We work with a number of clients across the world. Um, GCS Connect is our kind of hub for uh, branding content that can really help us and help our clients. What we try to do is connect expert talent to innovative companies like Validus. And GCS Connect does webinars, events, and kind of recorded conversations so that we can really help spread the word about how to recruit best and how to really connect with that expert talent that people need, particularly in these times, to really push their businesses and their and their, their finances forward. So it's great to speak to someone like Kevin. Um, we've spoken to people throughout like different industries, and it's great to speak to someone really from the fintech and finance financial services industry. Um, Kevin is the managing director of Validus. Um, Validus is a financial risk advisor working in the market risk sector. Um, they uh, were founded in 2010. Uh, they've got four offices, uh, 50 employees across the world from, uh, from Toronto uh, through to Europe, mainland Europe. Kevin, as he's made sure I say, is a Canadian. Um, and uh, it's very important to say that um, he has been working in financial risk for 20 years. Again, I hope he doesn't mind me saying that. Um, and started off trying to trade in currencies uh, from Switzerland, came to the beautiful UK um, a good few years ago, um, working for high effects, I believe, and then set up the business uh, with a partner quite a few years ago. And it's been a really big success. GCS enjoy working with Validus, really, really, really in, in innovative company. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to what kind of Kevin has to say and how he can hopefully tell us how to invest in this world going forward. Said, I said I wouldn't go into too much detail on the uh, <laughs> on the markets, but it's always good to know. Yeah, um, anything, but, um, but I've obviously introduced myself now, but it's good to kind of come from your side. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Kevin, what you're interested in and, 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 and your, your kind of market and your background. Yeah, no, thank you. So, uh, as you said, I, I started working in uh, in the, the risk business almost 20 years ago. Sure. Actually, it was just after the the 2001 financial crisis. Mm -hmm. um, so, I kind of started in crises, um, started yeah. trading currencies uh, and and commodities for for hedging purposes for large corporate uh, cor large corporations like Dow Chemical, uh, Rio Tinto. Um, and then it decided because that's obviously when you're working in that business, you're you're effectively a cost center. And yep. I always wanted to kind of move over and become a revenue generator. So I, that's when I moved to the UK and worked for a small uh, brokerage business here uh, in in Windsor, where we had an advisory arm advising corporate clients on how to hedge uh, currency in this case. Um, and then a couple of years after that, I, I founded or co-founded Validus with, uh, with my business partner sure. uh, and then expanded beyond FX into other, uh, other asset classes. Sure. Okay. So, yeah, now we focus primarily on the private capital market. So our clients would be institutional investors, private equity funds, pension funds, that kind of thing. And I guess, I mean, we, we talk quite a lot about the kind of current economic standpoint. I mean, how are those companies finding it at the moment? Is it, is it, you know, I'm sure it's very difficult times for them like it is for everyone else, but maybe even more for them when they're looking at where to invest and what's happened to their investments already. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, that's one of the interesting things about our business. There's a certain element of counter cyclicality to it. So, you know, as clients get more nervous about macro risks, mm. uh, that's when our services and our products become more important. Um, so certainly, you know, what we've seen in the last couple of months, uh, you know, I, obviously it's a health crisis primarily, but then that morphs into a, a market crisis. So we've seen a lot of volatility uh, across the board, FX commodities, you know, oil price going negative, interest rates going negative or getting very close. Um, so all of this has a big effect on returns. And, uh, and that's what we do. We, we help our clients kind of de-risk their portfolios from those uh, from those factors. I think what's really interesting about this particular crisis, so I mentioned I started my career in 2001, then obviously we had the big 2008 financial crisis. So this is my third 
third one to an extent. Yeah. And what's really interesting about this one is for the, for the first time, it's a combination of a market crisis uh, with, you know, almost an operational risk component as well, because everyone is working remotely. Um, you know, and when you, when you're in our business, you know, which is effectively a trading business or a derivatives trading business, you know, and you've got everyone from the banks at home working from, from home, you know, that, you know, that's, we've never had that before. So dealing with huge amounts of volatility combined with huge amounts of kind of operational, uh, risk and obstacles, it's been a really, uh, yeah, it's been a really interesting, uh, couple of months for sure. Yeah. And I've, you know, it's definitely something that is difficult to predict. So, so go on, Kevin. So would you, would you say that in any way you could have predicted this happening? Was this running in any of your kind of market risk calculations at any point? Uh, no, <laughs> okay, I can, I can, I can, I'm not going to even pretend uh, that we, we were trying to forecast in this. What I would say um, is, you know, I think we've been a little bit cautious about overall macro conditions um, before this hit. So obviously we, this is kind of like, you know, the, the straw that broke the camel's back in a way. There was a lot of risks building up in the system, particularly yeah. with respect to, to leverage and debt. Um, you know, on a public and private level. And obviously what this did was that just turbocharged that uh, yeah. trend, which was already in place. So I think the vulnerabilities we were aware of and we were highlighting, um, but yes, clearly, clearly we weren't highlighting the specific trigger event, which, which I think would have been, been very difficult to predict. And I, and I guess as well, it's um, as well as being operational risk, as well as being a kind of market risk, it's also linked to the kind of the way it's kind of come out of China as well and the reliance, as it were, on, on China and the supply chain and that sort of thing. And it's kind of the whole... Yeah, I mean, I, there's a lot, of, a lot of factors, you know, in terms of how the whole global economy is structured, which I think are yeah. going to be um, impacted by this, you know, supply chain vulnerabilities and all kinds of things like that, which is not really our thing. But, you know, the, the, the really interesting thing about our business is it does to some extent capture everything. So yeah, we're, we don't focus on supply chain risk, you know, but even that gets, you know, that's part of what drives the, the dollar versus the remit versus the euro, you know, all of these things um, come into play. So, which is why I think the business is so, so interesting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's it will obviously kind of come into a little bit more kind of, you know, how your technology and other technologies can kind of help kind of the industry and the financial services industry going forward. Because I think a lot of this is about how leadership drives innovation but let's let's wind it back first i mean as you said you've been through three different now recessions and downturns hooray <laughs> and they are pretty cyclical aren't they so you can kind of pretty much say they're going to come up every eight to ten years aren't they so yep. um and you you've been at different stages in your career i guess at different times because like i think you said you kind of just started probably was a kind of senior manager and now you're a business owner so so what I mean, we, we understand those kind of business challenges and the differences of those because we've spoken about that and other ones. But, you know, from, from your side, how, how, how have you learned from previous, um, you know, downturns that have affected the way you're kind of dealing with this one, if you know what I mean? And what, 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 um, what, what learns have you taken that are helping you now? Yeah, I, mean, I think if you, if you look at it from the perspective of, of macro risk management, so what we do as a business, you know, I think you know, every crisis, every crisis is an experience you go through and they're not exactly the same, but there are certain commonalities that flow through all of them. So, you know, I could, there's a few that I could choose, but the, in, in the financial markets, the most obvious would be liquidity. So liquidity drives everything. Hmm. And so, you know, that was true in 2001, it was true in 2008 and it's true now, you know, yeah. uh, and so it's something that liquidity is one of those risks that no one cares about until it becomes the most important thing in the world, you know, it's yeah, totally right, yeah. binary. I'm just kidding. and, uh, and so that if, you know, 2001, that was something I didn't know. 2008, I'd been through it once and now I've been through it a couple of times. So I was very prepared for that component. I think, you know, so that's in terms of the macro risks and in terms of our business, in terms of kind of management, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't think it was, you know, I think it, it it, it, you know, like with anything, you know, with more experience, um, you, know, you know, when I started my career, I, I was being managed and now I, I'm managing. Uh, so I think, you know, you, you remember what, what it felt like to you. So whenever you're going, especially, I guess, in the financial services business, which is hyper volatile, mm. um, you know, 
people can get quite nervous um, when, yeah. when market crisis hits, uh, both from the perspective of their clients and their, but also from the perspective of, them, of themselves, you know? Mm. And so I think, you know, you learn how important it is to, you know, to, to communicate very clearly and very quickly in terms of what's happening in the markets, but how does that affect the business? What's happening to, to the business? What's, you know, what's happening to our strategies and our plans? Are they evolving to yeah. accommodate the changes in the external environment? If so, how, how is that going to affect you as an individual employee? Um, so I think the importance of that was something that, that I learned, you know, very, you know, th there were lessons I learned over the years, both from managing and being managed, um, which I think, yeah. yeah, certainly are important in times like these. I mean, and just just so we know, I mean, it's obviously there's quite a lot of businesses that we've spoken to that are really, really affected by this, but also some businesses that are, are doing well, like having having good crises. If, would you say that's that's the case with Validus at the moment? Is it, you know, yeah. are you yeah, seeing uh, kind of an upturn and interest increasing? Yeah, I think, I mean, there's there's two sides to it for sure. So, I and, mean, you know, sitting here sort of two to three months into it, yeah. I get a much different perspective than I did two to three months ago. Yeah. Um, I think what I, you know, two to three months ago, my concerns were much higher than they are now for my business, for our business. Yeah. Um, you know, I think we just didn't know how it was going to affect our clients. We didn't know how it was going to affect our ability to sell. We didn't even know how it was going to affect our operational capabilities. You know, yeah. We, yeah. we were, you know, we, we, we thought about these kind of things, but to, you know, for example, whenever we thought about these kind of risks and, and operationally how it would affect us, we always said, okay, we've got offices all over the world. You know, if one goes down, we can yeah. Yeah, yeah, the other. Know, and all of a sudden that, which seemed like a pretty good, you know, yeah. pretty good risk <laughs> mitigation, yeah. Yeah. didn't work, right? We had to go fully remote with about one week's notice. And so, you know, and we thought we could do it, but we never tested it. Um, yeah. And, uh, and it did work, you know, so I, it, that was great. I think in terms of our clients, our clients, you know, being focused on the private capital space is good, you know, because they're mm. more robust. Um, yeah. They're not necessarily subject to the same, going back to liquidity, the same liquidity uh, risks that some other, um, you know, entities or investors might be subject to. And there's certain protections there, which makes our client base, you know, more stable. And they also think, want to, they want to do stuff, don't they? That's the whole reason they're in the game, isn't it? You know, you talk about. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, again, there's, there's different perspectives. You know, we have some clients in the distressed debt world who definitely, this is the world, this is the type of environment where there's opportunities for them. We have other clients who invest in travel businesses, which this is a very tough environment for them. Yeah. Um, you know, it may end up that they see some opportunities as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have, you know, just like, you know, the general economy, our clients, there's a dis, you know, disparity in terms of how, how they're affected. Um, but I think, um, yeah, overall, the, you know, probably the biggest negative impact is just the sales cycle is extended, um, yeah. which is, you know, uh, that is no surprise at all. It's exactly what we expected. And to be honest, it's not been as bad as we thought. I mean, even the idea of closing a sale remotely, never having met your client that would we didn't know if we could do that because we'd never had to do it before um mm. but it turns out we can't you know and we have so uh yeah uh, so i think overall you know have have we had a good credit yeah i think we have you know i think no, that's good it's great it's great to hear and it's great to hear there are kind of businesses out there that uh, you know we talk a lot in this leadership series about surviving and thriving you know about yeah you know, no for sure forward and using this time to maybe reset your business. But also we, we talk a lot in, in our business about focusing on industries and sectors that are, that are thriving. You know, that's what we have to do as a recruiter and we are seeing ones. I mean, obviously the ones that you would think about kind of medical, you know, um, you know, online education is another one that we're really seeing kind of great growth in, but definitely there are pockets and companies as well. I think who have really good kind of backup and, that sort of kind of platform as it were and this is why this these these conversations are interesting because partly it could be to do with kind of luck but also yep. it's to do with the leadership and stuff so so you got your team around you you know and and it's and it's working well and you talked about kind of going remote so you i mean you just dropped that into conversation we did that within a week 
which really is actually quite amazing. Really, it's like changing your whole business model in a week. So, sure. so how did you do that? How did you make that make that work well? And how you know three months yeah. down the line, what 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 correct decisions yeah. do you think you made? So yeah, they, there's, so in our business, there's three core pillars, right? There's an advisory business, which is yeah. effectively like a management consulting business. Yeah. The trading business where we trade derivatives, um, you know, about three hundred billion dollars worth a year, so quite a heavy volume. Yeah. And then we have a technology development business. Yep. And these all work together. It's very integrated, but they're, you know, they're, they're the three pillars of the business. So I think the, fir the first and the third, we were less worried about from an operational perspective. Obviously, in technology, you, yep. know, it, you can work remotely relatively easily. I think from a strategy and advisory side, there's challenges there because that's often done in person. But certainly, the work itself, you can do remotely. There's no problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the concern we had was with the the trading business. Mm. Uh, for a start, it's regulated. You know, uh, you, you need to there's certain. You know, for example, you need to if you're trading on the phone, it needs to be recorded. A very simple example. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, but there's all these kind. You know, you, you know, theoretically, you shouldn't be trading remotely, right? So you know, the first thing we had to do was make sure, from a regulatory perspective, that that would be fine. Obviously, it was. Everyone is in the same boat. So the, yeah. our regulator, <laughs> like every yeah. other regulator. Um, you know, allowed that to happen. And then there's the, you know, the, the tech, not the technological support, you know, very simple things. Does everyone have the right trading uh, platforms, the right hardware, the Bloombergs, every, everything you need to trade. We yeah, yeah. For all of Which our traders. A really big uh, kind of home, like big office PC with lots of power, don't you, to kind of really get these things. Exactly, exactly. So we, um, so yeah, we, there were certainly some things we had to put in place very quickly, you know, certain hardware we had to, mm make sure we upgraded for, you know, and we didn't, you know, from, from a Bloomberg standpoint, make sure everyone had access to, to market data when they needed it. Uh, we built our own trading system, so we don't use an outsourced trading system. So that was very helpful. You know, we could, um, you know, we could make sure that everyone could access that from wherever they were very, in a very so you could poke it quite easily and give it more power as required. That's right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think we, we were in a good position because most of the systems were our own. We, we built them. Um, mm -hmm. So we were, uh, I think that, that put us in a good place. Um, so yeah, we, you know, and, you know, we had, a, we had a very good team on the technology side, you know, of people who, um, who did a great job and, uh, and got us, you know, set up operational and, and working very, very quickly. Um, yeah. So, yeah. yeah, it was, uh, it couldn't have gone better, really. And do you think you, as the, as the leader within the business, the managing director, kind of took a kind of real kind of you felt it was important to really push that yourself, or had you kind of delegated that? What, I mean, what was your key focus during that three month period to to make it successful? Yeah, I mean, I think delegating was very very important because I I'm not a techno technology guy myself, right? Like mm -hmm. I know what we need to have to operate, but I don't know how everything works in, in detail. So I was, uh, you know, my job, I, the way I see my job is I need to have the right people in the right places. Um, yeah. That was the case before the crisis. Now this was a great test of that. You know, if, if, <laughs> if I had not done that job well, if I didn't have the right people in the right places, mm -hmm. it could have you know, not gone as well. Um, but I did and, and everyone did a great job. But mm -hmm. certainly, yeah, I saw my job more as um, A, you know, the delegation and B, just coordinating the communication, making sure everyone knew what everyone else was doing, making sure there was a clarity of, of message and, and purpose within the business. Um, and that's still my job. I mean, you know, obviously, we're still working remotely today. And um, I think that's probably the biggest challenge is just making sure that, you know, everyone knows what's going on, you know, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which sounds pretty basic. Yeah, and I think that's a, that's what a lot of the leaders have said is obviously communication is important from a leader letting people know what's going on, and obviously it's more difficult to to do it when you can't sit in a room with them and have a conversation. Exactly. So, what yeah. would you say would your be your best kind of a piece of advice for the way you're kind of communicating as a leader? What, what would be your best tools and what you're using? Yeah, I think you know, there's a couple of things we did right away, right? So I think we, right away, we, we, we felt that this was going to be the most important success factor here was making sure the communication lines worked. So one of the, you know, we set up, you know, very regular and very frequently all company communications, you know, via Zoom or Teams or whatever. Um, so we, we do that 
at least weekly and we do that you know it's, it's not and also we, we want to make it interesting engaging so we get you know you know guest speakers coming in from you know from academia or from you know banks or whatever yeah. from, um and how are they dealing with it how are they yeah. how are they dealing with the situation so we have you know we have quite a lot of that we also ensure that each of the teams have even more frequent communication usually daily or you know uh and i think one of the benefits that we found so we're you know we're quite a geographically dispersed business um, yeah. for our size um, with four offices and what we found is there was actually some benefits here because in the past you know if you're the main office is in london um uh, and so if you're in, a, in one of the smaller offices let's say in toronto sometimes you might feel you're not quite as plugged in uh, yeah, yeah I see the that. environment we have now everyone's kind of the same right and i think yeah. uh, and that just so there's definitely been some uh, some positives that we've gotten out of that yeah, and I think, you know, that's, there's, there's a lot of kind of positives kind of coming out of it in terms of, you know, how people can work together and collaborate easier because location isn't, isn't a problem anymore. You know, exactly. we're, yeah. all, we're all kind of, we could be a metre away or we could be a million miles away, but you're still talking on a, on a video call and that sort of thing. So it's easy to collaborate. And like you said, it's therefore it's easier to build up relationships, links, Across time zones, across countries, that maybe wasn't so easy to kind of do now. So, so yeah, there's definitely that 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 kind of remote element that really helps kind of internal communication. And from your side, they've had to work from home. You know, how how are you finding it? You know, kind of what what are the pros and the cons for you personally? I mean, I think the pros, the first and foremost, is just time. You know, I think if you if I added up my amount of time traveling, either from here to one of our offices or between offices, international travel, I would say I probably spent one to two weeks, you know, uh, a month yeah. travel, you know, a lot of like, that's, a, you know, yeah, yeah. it's incredible. Like a third to, you know, a third to a half of my time is literally on planes or trains or whatever. Yeah, I know the I don't miss that for sure. <laughs> exactly. Or sitting in airports or whatever. Uh, yeah. And you can do some work there. So, you know, it's not like you're totally unproductive, but, you know, it's, it's not ideal. So I found, you know, currently working from home, productivity wise, you know, actually is much higher uh, just because yeah. it's less wasted time. So that's been, I think, one of the good things. I mentioned the other thing about, you know, the, from, from an international standpoint, just feeling more connected to the various offices we have. I think that's been a clear benefit. Uh, and I think focus has been a bit easier because, you know, when you're working in an office, and I don't, not that this is a bad thing, but, you know, people will often stop by and you have a chat and, you know, that's less frequent. Typically now when you have conversations, there's a clear purpose for them. Um, yeah, that's right, you, yeah. you can focus. So I think that's the positive. I think the negative, probably the biggest negative would be the flip side of that. It would be just the, you know, you know, the social element, you know, whether it's at the office or, you know, even you know, going for dinner, not with, with clients or with colleagues or whatever it is, you know, I find in our business, that's a very, and I'm sure in yours, that's a very important part of what we yeah, do. It's and it's also, it's also an enjoyable thing. You know, you, yeah. you have good conversations with, with clients and, and with colleagues and you learn a lot. Um, and so that's, you know, with the best, you know, all the best intentions, a Zoom call with your client is not the same as going for dinner and talking, you know, talking about life and about, um, you know, it's just not the same. And so that that's a clear negative. Well, I did a, an in, uh, interestingly, um, myself and one of my managers both went to Costco yesterday at the same time. So afterwards, <laughs> we had a beer in a park. Because it's my it's kind of park beer. I think that's going to be a new, whole new, whole new way of. Uh, you know, getting together for a social. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure that was lovely, but a, but, a, but a beer a beer in the park still is not the same. You know? No, no, no. It was <laughs> nice though. It was good. The weather was nice. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, agree. I agree. So, so obviously, we talked a lot about yourself as a, as a kind of leader, um, and we can kind of do this in two ways. But what advice would you give, and how do you see the kind of market kind of coming out of this in the next six months? So, if if I was a business leader, which I am. What would you think about kind of investing in the business and, and, and how you think that the economy is going to come out of this crisis? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I think, so the first thing I would say would be, you know, there's, you, there's often opportunity in crisis, 
Yeah. And, uh, you know, when we set the business up in 2010, that was, there's, it's not a coincidence that that was in the aftermath of a financial crisis. So to an extent, Validus is born in crisis. Yeah. And so when we, we see a crisis, we also are always looking for the opportunities that will inevitably come out of it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, in terms of what does that mean? That means don't panic. Um, it means, you know, be aware of the short term, but focus more on the long term. Um, yeah. And that would be different for everyone's business. Yeah. Um, I think for, you know, for our business, you know, what does it mean for, you know, for investors? It means more attention is going to be paid to market risks, which obviously is our core business. But I also think it'll mean more attention will be paid to operational risk, you know, yeah. which I think a re I never thought about our business quite in that way. You know, and by that, what I mean is, you know, if you're an investor uh, and you've got all this information flying around on Excel spreadsheets and you've mm. got some confirmations from your bank in a PDF or and you're trying to collate that information and make decisions with it when you're sitting in your, you know, your second bedroom, you know, that that's not ideal. That's not an ideal position to be in to trade millions of dollars of derivatives that you need. Yeah. To. Uh, so, you know, with, with our, our platform, we see that as, okay, that's a great opportunity. We can give the clients a place where they can have all this information and make all these decisions, which is in the cloud, remote. Um, yeah. you know, so I think you know, that's just one example for our business. And, and I'm sure, you know, for other businesses, similar opportunities are there. Um, but if it's you, if you look data, at data driven conversation is di driving data driven decisions, isn't it? Rather than that's you know, right. Exactly. Should... It's, yeah, it's exactly what it is. It's, it's having the data at the right place and having everyone who needs access to it, having access to it, um, you know, and being able to trust it, you know, <laughs> I trust that the data is correct. Um, yeah. you know, that's a really important thing all the time, but especially in, the, in an environment like this. And I think what, what this environment has done is just open people's eyes to the importance of that. Uh, yeah those kind of enterprise tools, if I, if I can put it that way. Um, and that that's going to be an opportunity for sure. Yeah, I think, I mean, we see it in recruitment. You know, if you think about recruiters generally on a big sales floor, and you know that from working on a trade floor, you're surrounded by people, you can see what people are doing, can't you? You can see what your trader is doing because you're basically a trader is there on the phone playing with the Bloomberg system or whatever. So, you know, he's doing some stuff, right? Or she, when everyone's working remotely, we're talking about data driven decisions on terms of activity. Like, you know, how do we really get this stuff on the system? How do we know how many calls are being made? How many interactions are being made? And, and I, I think that that is just an example of how you need the right data around you to kind of make decisions on your business going forward. And I guess that's, that's what, that's what you promote, isn't it? That's what your software enables people to do. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. So I think, uh, like I said, in the short term, you know, it's, it's, you know, I think it's just a, a great addition to the value proposition and in the long term i think there's going to be a lot of opportunities there um you know we we need to think about it you need to reflect on it you know um, but definitely there's always opportunities whenever you have these big shifts which is clearly what we, we're seeing now and how else do you see you know kind of the future business landscape you know how else do you think uh, like innovative technologies because a lot of people talk about disruptive technologies and i i assume you would class some of the software that you do and some of the services you provide is being disruptive. What, what other big disruptors do you think are coming within the kind of financial services industry, as it were, or particularly kind of market risk industry that you, you, you think will, will change it in the, in the coming season? Yeah, I think that's a really good question, which is, it's always been a, a priority or a focus for us. You know, we're, we originally were and still are to a certain extent a professional services business. You know, yeah. if you think about what a professional services business traditionally has been, you know, it's been, you know, people, it's been people yeah. going into offices, presenting things and, you know, it's, it's you know, your classic management consulting model. Now we, you know, we, that's um, the, pillar, the advisory pillar that you spoke about. That's, that's the people. That's it. it. That's it. Exactly. And that, the, the, the issue, we, so when we started the business 10 years ago, our goal to, to a certain extent was to disrupt that model, you know, was to, yeah. to enable, because the problem with that model is it's very difficult to scale because if you want to grow 
you need to add more people and which you might that might sound easy but depending on how specialized your business is to get people to be able to do it it can take one two three years to um, i work in a people-based industry i know exactly how difficult it is to scale that you know <laughs> that's it. so we yeah. thought okay you know what we're doing at heart is we're making decisions with data that's our business mm. now you can hire lots of expensive people who work for goldman sachs for 10 years to make great decisions um but at the end of the day it's data in and, and and you know and and outputs that are based on that data which can be automated can be coded yeah. and so our objective was and remains how do you automate as much as you can you can never automate everything so our goal isn't to eliminate the the people component of the business which is always going to be in my view an important part of it yeah um, both from a point of view of just wisdom you, we talked before about you know, living through crisis and learning, you know, that's something that I think would be very difficult to, to code that kind of experience and life. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you're always going to, it will make it too risk averse. So it's always going to think there's going to be, everything is a risk. Do you know what I mean? So you have to kind of, un, exactly. un it, there's a subjective element to it, right? Yeah. You need to interpret <laughs> the data, right? You need to interpret it. So, you know, I think there's always going to be to a certain extent, the need for that subjectivity. Um, but, let's say 50, 60, even 70% of what we do as, you know, consultants, you know, a lot of that can be codified. It can be um, automated. And, you know, I think that is, you know, that is the way things are going. And that's what, you know, that's, that's our business model, which is why our technology team is our biggest single team in the business, even though we're a professional services business. Yeah, because it's, it's backing that up. And I, I know because we spoke about it, we, we will see GCS is backed by private equity. I think there's some connection yep. there. But it's, it's interesting to know kind of when we speak to our private equity backers, the sort of data that's behind the decisions exactly. they make, I assume, because, you know, it all kind of, it all goes around in a big circle, doesn't it? So that's you know, right. Yeah. Really interesting. I think definitely for me, you know, the use of data and, and the importance of data and actually like linking into things like GDPR and that sort of stuff, like you said, like the Excel spreadsheets flying around and people le- like printing things off and that sort of stuff, you know, we're driven towards this, probably a better way, a better practice of working. Exactly. Now. Well, I think so. And I think the, you know, and even when it comes to, you know, cause on the one hand you might, that might sound scary, you know, in the sense of oh, automating away the jobs and all that. You know, mm-hmm. But I, I think I look at it very differently. And I think, you know, if you, if you talk to people in Validus, they would share that view. It's not about that. It's about automating the boring stuff, you know, yeah. you know, and it, may, it gives people more time to focus on the more interesting things, you know, yeah, yeah. More, more creative things. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, I think that's, so everyone wins there. You know, the client gets more efficiency and, and you know, and a better product for a better price. Um, and, and the employees get to work on more interesting things. So I think yeah. everyone wins. And would you, I mean, would you say, obviously, you said about the journey of your business being and you being the leader and you having this, this mantra is this is the way we're going to go and kind of those data, we're driving data driven decisions. Have you experienced kind of pushback on that? You know, is this something that oh, finally like this, this pandemic situation has allowed me to kind of finish it off? Or have you had a lot of, or have you hired people according to that mantra? Yeah, I think to assert, yeah, there's certainly self-selection there. You know, the, you know, if, if you're if you're joining Validus as part of that process, I think you'll you know you'll either buy into that or you won't, right? Um, yeah. it is, it's core to who we are. Um, I mean, the, if you ask anyone at Validus, you know, about my approach, you know, I, I talk about scale all the time. Everything we do is, can we scale it? How do we scale it? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's not a conventional professional services approach, probably. And so if you're you know, if, if you're a conventional professional services person, that may not, you know, be the, you know, may, may not appeal to you. Um, so I think, yeah, there's, is there pushback? I mean, I wouldn't say, I, I don't really know that, to be honest with you, yeah. to the sense of sure, not sure. within the business. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think the, not certainly not in the client, but I think, you know, mm-hmm. from a client perspective, you know, you know, they see the benefits of it, right? They see the fact that it's, you know, it's, a more, you know, technology is, if you can, you know, if, if you can codify something into a product, I think, you know, people understand that a lot more than, oh, you know, we'll mm-hmm. provide you with some intangible advice, you know, so I think 
from the market standpoint, it's, it, there's been no pushback. In fact, the opposite, I think it's been a pull. Um, you know, I think if you ask other people in our space, will will these ideas work? Yeah, you probably would get some skepticism, but um, but they don't obviously work for us. So, yeah. fantastic. Well, that's really good. And I mean, obviously, coming from a recruitment background, you know, Avalos is a company that we work with, and we know you're you're recruiting at the moment, which is great. Um, how do you think the recruitment landscape will kind of change post? post the pandemic now and we are starting to see green shoots things are starting to happen now so i think we're moving into that the phase two yeah. now. how do you think it will change in terms of recruitment i think yeah a couple of things would probably i think one would be the you know i think the the pendulum if, if you look at the technology world you know the pendulum about you know between working for a you know a stable employer and a conventional employment employee employer relationship versus contracting you'll probably see this, this pendulum swing a bit back not completely but i think you know the, the value people will place on uh on stability will rise i i i think we're seeing that already and i expect yeah. to a certain extent that premium will be valued more um i think from an employee standpoint the great thing is you will be able to get the benefit of both, right? I think, you, you know, mm -hmm. there will be more flexible arrangements that are available within, you know, the more traditional employer employee relationship. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, yeah, that, that's how I see it. Um, you know, you never know, but uh, I certainly think the early signs are that that's, that's how the market seems yeah, to be. Yeah, I think you, so. you probably know better than me though. <laughs> well, no, that's why, that's why I don't start talking to you about recruitment all the way through because that would be a bit <laughs> funny and ask me those questions, you know. But we're definitely seeing remote interviewing um, and um, opportunity over a larger like landscape, if you know what I mean, becoming more important. And I think that's really good for people because I think it allows a wider range of skill sets to be considered. And yep. if people have kind of broken the back of, we don't all have to work in the same location all the time, then straight away you're able to kind of fashion your business in a bit different way. And like you said about scale, you know, it's easier to scale with a group of like-minded people from a wider range than if you have to scale from even, you know, London or Toronto, you know, which are obviously big places, you know. So, so I definitely think that, you know, creating more kind of global teams is important. I think how that links into kind of internal communications, how that links into onboarding and training is going to be really, really key. Um, and then, yes, like you said, I think that companies are starting to think about the post kind of pandemic world. Um, hopefully we are in that, you know, and it doesn't kind of happen again. But I think companies, you know, leaders have learned a lot from this, from this process that will help them to drive their businesses in different directions. And I think those are the businesses that will be most successful. So, Fingers crossed, it's both of our businesses, my friend. So, yeah, yes, we'll yes, be all right. Yeah. <laughs> good exactly. stuff. It's really good to speak to you, Kevin. A really interesting conversation. And uh, I do wish your business kind of good good luck over kind of coming six months. And uh, I think I've picked up quite a few tips there, particularly with regards to market risk that I'll, <laughs> I'll use my own investments and that sort of thing. So thank you very much. Yeah, no, thanks, David. Very, very good to speak to you.